Uh, okay, why can't my car drive itself? Let's start from the beginning. Uh, so, my name is Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Brandström in Swedish. I uh, usually call myself Sebastian Brandström these days. Um, software engineer at a company called Lyft in San Francisco, where we are right now. I wish you could see the outsides, but we're inside a conference room. Um, used to go to KH, of course, uh, 2001 F0F is my, my degree, Technics Physique. Um, I lived in Stockholm for a few years after that, uh, worked at Ericsson, HiQ, um, and then I moved to London in 2008 uh, to work for a company there, uh, software, uh, mobile software actually, even before the iPhone, uh, and then, um, then I moved to San Francisco in 2011 uh, to join a little startup here, uh, which eventually turned into Lyft. And today, um, so, so Lyft is, is a major ride hailing company. You have likely heard of our competitor, uh, Uber, which uh, is international, but Lyft is only in America. We are, however, closely in like 30% in the market share here, so we're pretty big. It's a company with 2,000 employees. Um, when I joined, we were like group of five, basically, so it's been a big, big ride since then. Um, we've got a million rides per day, and this is key that we're still using human drivers, um, and, and that's what we're trying to do long term move away from because the whole industry is moving away from uh, from human drivers to self-driving cars. Uh, this is a picture of, a, a promo picture of how a Lyft video works. You see a passenger with a phone in hand. She's requested a ride using an app. Uh, here comes the driver um, with a human driver in it. Uh, with uh, And there had this uh, little device that I have down here too, uh, just to indicate your Lyft car. Um, and this is happening again a million times a day. But um, we're trying to get rid of this part here. We'll keep the vehicle, but long term, get rid of the driver. Now, here's a sad thing, right? As of when I'm doing this, and this is interesting because I understand this will be in a time capsule. Uh, as of 2017, there are no fully self driving cars, right? It's not technology we have as a civilization yet. But why is that? Um, so, what's funny about it is that if you look at what does a self driving car actually need to do? There are like pretty standard division into the various steps required to build a self-driving car. First, of course, we need localization, which answers the question, where am I? And then you need routing to answer the question, where am I going and how do I get there? Perception, as in what is around me, what is around the vehicle that is. Prediction, so what's likely to happen next? Assuming I know where I am, where I'm going, and what's around me, then what is supposed to happen next? And then, what action should I, as the vehicle, take, based on all this information behind me? And then finally, control. So, if I know what I need to do, how do I take that action? And <laughs> what, when you look at this, and you think in terms of the technology we have, it's quite easy to answer basically every single question. I mean, for localization, we have GPS. Um, GPS is not super accurate, but it, it does the job in many cases. We have various uh, inertial systems and slime and all things as well, but GPS is the main one. Where am I going? Well, we have maps. They tell us, go down the street, take a right, take a left. You know, that's how you get to your destination. What's around me? Every one of us is using cameras all the time. We have uh, sensors that work in the dark, like radars and lidars, uh, encoders, all kinds of things. What's likely to happen next? Well, physics models work pretty well. If you see a pedestrian, you can say that they're walking one meter per second. Well, in two seconds, they're going to be two meters ahead of where they are. It's quite easy. Um, now, what actions should I take? It's a little harder, but you know, driving is actually a rules-based system to some extent. There's the law that tells you how you need to drive, you need to stop at a stop sign. Um, and, and intersections, you take a right, you take a left, you go straight. It's pretty simple. And then there's algorithms to help you navigate around obstacles and those kinds of things. And finally, how do I take this action? Well, we clearly have actuators, like little motors that turn the steering wheel. Uh, we can push the, the brake pedal, the gas pedal. That's not very hard. Uh, and we have control theory, dating back to the 19th century, basically. These, these are very solid problems, most of these things. So. If that's the case, then, you know, if we can do all these things, why don't we have self-driving cars? 
What we do have is something like this, and this is a pretty common sight in San Francisco. This is uh, GM's uh, self-driving um, Chevy Bolt. Uh, there's actually a newer version of this. I see quite a bit in the streets these days, uh, but it basically it has the sensors I was talking about. It's got a number of cameras here. It's got two LiDARs that can see uh, at distance, measure distances to things, and see in the dark. Um, it's got uh, commercial GPS units and, and a wheel encoder. Um, but this is not a fully self-driving car. This car can drive itself under some circumstances. So again, why don't we have a fully self-driving car if we can do all these things in theory? Well, so this is Yogi Berra. Um, and this my, my favorite quote of Yogi Berra. He's a, a, a baseball guy. He was a baseball player and a baseball coach in America. He's not very well known outside of America. I would say, but he had all these sayings, and, and one is that in theory there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. So let's talk about the, uh, the practice. So P is for practice, or actually perception. So I just want to look at a couple of scenarios of, of driving scenarios, like you're in a car and you see things around you, and let's talk about what we're seeing, and then we'll draw some conclusions from that. So here's the scene. Um, I think we can quite clearly tell that we're in New York, we're uh, around Times Square somewhere. Um, we see all these people here standing on the side of the road. Uh, there's a green light for the cars, the traffic is so backed up that they're standing still. There's a cyclist here who looks to be a courier, or maybe just some kind of hipster cyclist. Uh, and there's a green walk, or like a walk sign for pedestrians there. Um, and, and you can see that these people are basically ready to cross here right now. Let's look at another scenario. I think this is also New York, just based on how it looks. There's a construction uh, zone here. One of the lanes is blocked off. Uh, there's a truck, almost certainly legally parked here on the sidewalk. There's these two guys here. Uh, they look like construction workers. One is wearing a hard hat. The other guy is wearing boots that also is sort of looked like the construction workers. I would guess that one of these guys actually drives that truck. Um, they're standing on the side talking about themselves. Here's a third one. Uh, looks like we're in London. Um, here's actually, the traffic is probably stopped here. There's a yellow light over there going that way, so it might be the same going this way. We see pedestrians crossing. This woman looks like she's holding a phone, looking at her phone as she's walking. It's a business district, a lot of like people in suits. Um, there's two cyclists here, one trying to merge in between the two taxis, and one guy that I think must be running, he's probably running the red light here, um, where the pedestrians have the right to walk. So, so why am I telling you all these things? So, basically, what I just told you, like, just consider how much societal and, and the human knowledge is in this. I'm using all these phrases, uh, construction worker, cyclist, courier, um, a very high level information. Um, and I was talking about the lady, she was carrying a phone, looking at the phone, and uh, probably indicates that she's not paying too much attention. There was the cyclist trying to run, run the red light, um, just because as a cyclist, you know, that they sort of bend the rules quite a bit more. And there are two, two facets to this. One is that there's just a lot of stuff that I know because I'm human, and I'm telling this to you people because you know, you're human too and you will understand what I'm saying when I use these words like construction worker and, and, and cyclist and courier. Um, they mean things to us and we understand what their motivations are and what they're trying to accomplish. So that's one facet of it. The other one is it's just too much information. Like I told you all these things, most of them don't actually matter. The only thing uh, that matters here might be the, 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 the person trying to run the red light, the cyclist, and the lady carrying the phone. Those things might be important to make decisions around driving. Most of the stuff is actually not that important, even though there's so much information there. And, and, and thirdly, one thing that's very obvious when you're driving actually, is that the rules are not sufficient, complete, or even consistent. Like, just try driving in a city following the rule book. If you refuse to break or even bend any law or rule, you're not gonna get anywhere. You're gonna get stuck because you have to cross a double yellow line, you have to like, take a right where you're not supposed to. There's like so many situations where you have to bend the rules. If you're just driving the speed limit in many cities, you're gonna get traffic backed up behind you. So, so basically driving is started communicating with your environment. And the problem is that there's just no obvious algorithm for this. 
So, so, so that is sort of the main issue why we, despite having all these uh, solutions to the problems I mentioned about self-driving, we don't obviously have a self-driving car right now. So there's sort of like a, an escape hatch when you don't know the algorithm and you don't know how to create one. Machine learning seems to be the go-to solution these days. So if you can't describe the algorithm, let's instead train a computer to infer what the algorithm must be. Or what an algorithm can be, because can many times be, be several different ones. Uh, and it's quite simple in general. If you choose a machine learning system, uh, many of these have been around since the 70s, but there has been great progress in, in the recent years. Second, you give it lots and lots of examples uh, of things. And these things can be anything, can be pictures, uh, you know, data points and measurements and whatever you, you want. Um, and you label them and say that this thing is called X, this other thing is called Y. And then through iteration, and computers are very good at iterating on things, you find or approach some kind of function that tries to identify the right label based on the data you're giving it. And then we use this function to try to figure out uh, information from things we haven't seen in the past. Let's look at a very simple example. These are basically data sets of green dots and yellow triangles. Um, they're sort of scattered all over the place here on a scale with from negative three to four uh, for some reason. And in the left example, we're telling the computer to find a linear, uh, linear function that can separate the green dots from the blue triangles. And the best approach, uh, the best solution we can come to is probably this line here. Uh, it doesn't actually classify everything correct. You can see that there are, uh, you know, blue dots, the blue, blue triangles below the line, uh, and there are green dots above the line. But it does a decent job, given a, a, a position here in the x y coordinate space. If you know that you're up here, you're almost certainly a, 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 a blue triangle. And if you're down here, you're almost certainly a green circle. On the right side, we're using some kind of hyperbolic function to try to do a better job at describing it. We're still misclassifying some points here. Um, there are some blue triangles in the, in the green space here, uh, and there are some, some green dots in the, in the, among the blue triangles, but these are approaching some kind of description of what's working. And these are very simple examples with two-dimensional data, but you can extract this, extrapolate this to much more uh, rich data sets. So, so between 2005 and 2015, there were basically enormous breakthroughs in machine learning. Uh, so specifically deep learning, which uh, you know, uh, what was, came out I think around 2000 or 2005, that kind of area is where we really started seeing research papers. And then there were enormous breakthroughs in how to apply GPUs, that is basically graphics cards to uh, do this rapidly. That, um, happened in the era up to 2015, and today it's pretty commonplace. Um, and they're really good at doing, for self-driving, or for car uh, em driving environments, two specific things, uh, segmentation and classification. So segmentation is using an image and trying to separate what is in this image. And classification is using this information from segmentation to identify what does each segment represent. I'll show you an example for something called SegNet. This is a very standard you know, research uh, project, but it's actually really good. Um, these are three photos of various driving environments. And we have trained this system with similar examples where we've taken pictures like this, and a human has manually drawn in where uh, a road is and where the signs are examples, uh, and, and, and cars and people. And, and after that, once you've done that with a few thousand images, for example, then you can start asking Given this image, where are all the things I care about? So, so we can see here, for example, that it has basically correctly classified the, the purple area seems to be the road pavement. The green, uh, the, the orange appears to be lines on the, on the road, uh, separators and that kind of stuff. This little peach colored thing is uh, a sign, like a road sign, like a stop sign or a, you know, any kind of warning sign or something. Yeah, green is, is forest, gray seems to be this guy. Uh, let's look at this scene with the same, same network, just a different photo. Uh, it also identifies buildings that are the deep uh, red color. Um, cars are apparently this dark purple, 
people are greedy. And you can see that this little bunch of people here is actually classified like all of these things are probably people. And again, the cars. And then the third one too. You see the buildings, this guy. You see the pavement. What's interesting here is that it's actually uh, not sure if this is, it looks like a, a sidewalk. Uh, but, to, but to be honest, as, even to me as a human observer, I'm not sure if that's a sidewalk or a, a, or a car uh, where you, I mean, you can drive as a car. So it's doing a really good job. This is saying that, and it's basically a machine learning based system. The other P, P is for performance. So we, we said uh, in the past it was for um, uh, practice, but now it's for performance. So, so to make these networks, like, like saying that here, work really well. This is probably trained on thousands and thousands of manually lab uh, labeled and, and iterated on um, examples of uh, driving situations. So while this works really well, it actually takes a lot of CPU processing to make it work. Um, and, and, and this is just a very, very simple example because segmentation classifications are like the first steps in the percep perception stack. Obviously, like we need a lot more. We need to also try to learn what happened next and try to infer what is the actual behavior we want uh, to do based on what we saw. And the compute demands are almost unfathomable. Like we need so much compute. So here's an example from NVIDIA. They just posted a, a paper about this yesterday, I think. Uh, this is the latest GPU they have, the Volta. Um, and they're, they're trying to just say that it scales linearly. But, it, but the, the, the point here is the, the images per second is the y-axis. And even like with eight GPUs that are really, really expensive, they can do like 1,800 images per section per, per second for training. And, and in a typical training set, you may have millions or even billions of them. So this requires like a lot of time. If you're doing 1,800 per second and you have a million, then that's uh, going to take a while. So while we're not there, like we, we, we don't have self-driving cars yet, we're in a very promising space. So basically, this is interesting again because this is going to be a time capsule and history might prove me wrong, but I don't think we're waiting for a major breakthrough in theory. Like we sort of know uh, a path forward to solve this problem. But we need a lot more and more efficient computing performance. The good thing is that there are enormous investments going into this, like literally billions and billions of dollars going into self-driving cars right now. And right now, progress is extremely rapid. One example, Google's progress. So, so this is the miles per disengage. It's just a kind of a dumb metric, but it shows how many miles you can drive with a car being self-driving without it, uh, you having to take over manually. And, and this is between 2014 and 2015, they went from five, uh, 800 to 5,000. So, so they're making big improvements. And this is pretty common across the industry. So I think the main takeaway is that we don't have self-driving cars today, but your kids probably don't have, uh, have to learn to drive. Uh, you can save that money, put it somewhere else. They don't need driving classes. Because within the next five years, you almost can see self-driving cars in very limited areas, uh, limited, uh, weather and all these kinds of things. Humans are still going to be needed for a while. But there's so much money, and there's so much talent going to it. And I believe the, the, the belief in the industry is that we don't, we're not waiting for any theoretical breakthroughs. We just need to, have to figure out how to use the tools we already have. And then soon enough, we'll have a self-driving car. Thank you.